me to Romans 10. <clears throat> and um, now we <clears throat> we're in Romans 10 because uh, if you keep the progression of the chapters that we've been touching on and dealing with, Romans 10 is the one we're supposed to be in. <clears throat> but Romans 10 also is a very uh, similar in in content to chapters three and four, <clears throat> half of chapter three, last half, and chapter four, which are primarily dealing with faith. And um, that's what we've been dealing with. We've been dealing with faith. <clears throat> and we are taking, I'm taking my time to go through this on one front because um, I, <clears throat> I believe that we, maybe all, maybe some have, uh, but have not fully grasped the true significance of faith in terms of life coming out of death. Now, I think that, I think, I think in that concept of life out of death, <clears throat> I think there are things that we have, we've all grasped. But when I was at uh, Berean, they taught life comes out of death. <clears throat> and, um, and basically, it was an understanding of like a principle, but it wasn't a principle of the nature of God. And, and much of the time, when I speak of principles, I'm speaking of principles of the nature of God, not just some sort of a teaching principle, well, this is a principle. <clears throat> um, it only becomes, sure, <laughs> it only becomes uh, significant um, when it proceeds from God. And, um, and when I say proceeds from God, I mean proceeds from his being. Um, out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaks. It is not just teaching from God or it is not just um, ideas that we're supposed to grasp, or it is not just um, things that are true because they're true in nature, like, you know, natural nature. And here comes the chalkboard. And um, <clears throat> thank you, Shay. 44. <laughs> wow. And just quite frankly, I don't, I don't really care about teachings or doctrines and stuff that don't emanate from out of the person of God. I don't. I don't care about them. I don't care about them. Because they have no real substance. They are just facts about God. It is teaching about God. Therefore, it's theology, and it's not God. And... Um, to find truth and to find reality in the manner that the New Testament wants us to do that, it's going to require us to discover all of these things in him, as him. All right. So what I'm about to get into <clears throat> is going to be a whole, <clears throat> a whole lot of different angles that I question whether you've really grasped all of them. Now, some of them, obviously, you have. <clears throat> the first paragraph, I would say most of it until I get to the end, and then, well, probably the first paragraph. <clears throat> but then I want to introduce some things Maybe that you also know, but you don't know why, or you don't, you, you're not, um, you're not grounded in it in a manner that would cause it to rule your life. You still use it. We're talking about faith. <clears throat> so, as per the, this whole new 
semester of teaching this, I've been doing a lot of reading because, there, I mean, I, in class because there's just a lot to cover. So I'm going to ask you in your own heart right now to just pray and ask the Lord to help you to at least for the seeds to fall into your ground because this is an issue of Jesus and you. This is an issue of are we honoring him with true not true faith but fullness of faith fullness of faith so if you'll just do that while i i begin reading here this subtitle is called the promise of life coming through death which is very familiar to our ears believing in resurrection is a major part of the faith that christians adhere unto but resurrection is an automatic of death but for resurrection to come about, there must be a death. So when we talk about believing in resurrection, we are confessing our faith in the function of death to be the father of re resurrection. Faith, as Paul sees it, involves a death, and the life or resurrection out of it is only a result of that, of that principle, of that reality, of that teaching. It is by the same faith or belief system in which Jesus operated. <clears throat> All right. That statement right there is a little, maybe not familiar to our ears. The faith that we're being called to exercise is the same belief system that worked in Jesus that works by his nature. But it's, it's, it worked in Jesus. And I'll read something here that'll help hopefully satisfy that. Faith, is, as Paul sees it, involves a death, and the life or resurrection out of it is only the result of that principle. It is by the same faith or belief system in which Jesus operated that life comes out of death. He knew, did, now you tell me if this isn't a true statement about Jesus. He knew that the plan called for his death and that the manifest benefits to others would come in his resurrection. Do, do you think that that was a surprise to him? <laughs> you know, they killed him, and then, then he got up, and things worked out, you know, and he got kind of, wow, I wasn't expecting this. Absolutely not. That wasn't the case. So, so <clears throat> just trying to put it in a context so that we can comprehend it, because for him, it, was a, it is a thing of his nature. For us... We have to begin in faith in this thing before it's worked in us as Christ in us as life. And so, so um, we have to see that Jesus knew what he was doing when he came to this earth. He came to die. He didn't come to, to fix everything. He didn't come to change the world. He didn't come to, to throw out the, the evil Pharisees. He didn't come to throw out the evil Romans. He didn't, come, he didn't come to do any of that, that everybody thought that that's what he came for. He came to die, and he did that for one reason, because it was a good idea. No, because God discussed it in the, the determinant council of God and said, well, let's do this. I've got an idea. Let's do this. No because it is in, in, in accord with his nature. Therefore, you could say it's in accord with God's belief system. He believes in life out of death, and he believes that that's how to get it, and not any other way. And that's why Jesus, yes, he healed. Yes, he did this and that. But ultimately, it didn't do anybody any good, ultimately. You know, Lazarus died again, and, you know, so, and, and Jesus said, you know, when the Greeks came seeking for him in John 12, 23, Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross, and he says his response to them was, except the seed fall into the ground and die, you're not going to get any more of it. You're not going to, there will be no more than me, Jesus basically saying I'm going to end up being the only one that is of a different kind that is of this kind unless 
I die. And he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the seed fall on the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And it's basically saying that he hadn't brought forth fruit yet because he believes it comes by death. Now, I know that messes with a bunch of religious people because they think everything that God does is uh, fruit. But he's talking about fruit of his life. He's talking about, more specifically, fruit of his death. And he's talking about something that will last, something that will remain. And so, um, so he's saying, i, I got to die. I'm not getting anywhere by just doing these things. All right. Now, try to, try to pull yourself out of you and put yourself in his mindset, put yourself in his place, or put yourself beside him as one that understands God. He believes that there is no life, there is no seed after his kind unless he dies. You can heal flesh. You can cast demons out of flesh. But unless there is a death, nobody's going to get this kind of nature and life. Okay? He believes that. Now, he doesn't believe that because, um, okay, i am make some statements here. Uh, he didn't believe that because um, they thought it up and God said, well, th this will work. He didn't believe that because... Um, He didn't believe it because it, it's just some sort of a concept that God discussed and said, let's do this. He doesn't believe it because he believes it will work in this situation. He believes it because this is his nature and the way that he operates and he knows it for trillions of years before time, before time because that's the way he's always been. Okay? So, that, so it's hard for us to comprehend that because that's pure God. But folks, that's what he's calling for to just start by having faith. He's, he's saying, I want your faith to be life comes out of death. Now we haven't, you know, we barely started in this, this section of this and there is a, there's a lot of ground to cover. But, but, but for most of us in this place, we say, yes, life comes out of death. I don't think anybody hardly would argue with that here. Um, I don't know that we've all realized that life coming out of death is the way of God. I don't know that, I think that maybe we thought before the foundation of the world they foresaw this and said, oh no, somebody's going to have to die, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, because we foresee that they're going to sin and they're going to mess up and everything. But you see, with God, if he's looked at that and he said somebody's going to have to die, he understood it was going to have to be him. Okay, why? Where did he get that? Where in the world did that concept come from? It, it's, not a, it, it's not a concept. It's not a concept to God. It is a nature. This is God. The cross, that's God. That's why that's the symbol right there. That crucifix, that's the symbol of this God that we call Christian. Okay. So until we, you know, I mean, I've only read one paragraph here, but until we, until we lay hold of that, and there'll be more to help build that, but until we lay hold of that, we're always going to think that life out of death is an option. We are. We're going to think it's an option. We think it was an option with God. We think it was a one-time big splash. And that he's no longer 
a slain lamb on a throne. He's a victorious conqueror that'll, you know, he'll kill you. You know. All right. Now, now we don't get that. We don't get that really even from the book of Revelation. I mean, if you go through the book of Revelation like we did in the Revelation class, and you go chapter by chapter, book by book, you're going through that book, and you start seeing that there's something going on in heaven and something going on earth, and all of God's people, every time that they're killed, like the, the, three, the two witnesses or the, the saints are killed, you know, they made war with the saints, and the saints got defeated, it shoots up in heaven, and there's this big rejoicing thing. I don't want to reteach that class. But I looked at it, I studied it, and I went, oh, my God. And, you know, it, and just another thing on that that I shared was I found that every time it got to the point where there would be this big war where Jesus would defeat, it, there was just, it was just nothing. Now, some of you were in that class in the book of Revelation. And I'm sure, I'm confident that you went back and you listened to those tapes and you poured over those tapes and you looked up to see if I was lying because Bereans, that's what we were taught, searched the scriptures to find out whether the things they're being taught really are of God. You know. And that, by the way, that's one of our foundational principles, searching the scriptures. I'm not trying to make you feel bad, but I mean, doesn't every other church do that? Just listen to somebody preach and then, you know, I mean, but there has to be, um, let's put it this way. I want you to prove me wrong. I want you to question. I want you to not take everything I say. I want you digging into the word and saying, well, I don't know about that, that whole stuff about that, you know, God believed in life out of death or da 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 or that wasn't a one-time thing or all that stuff. Some of you don't know that. Just because I say it doesn't make it true. You don't know that. But I want you to know something. From my perspective, I know that, and I can sit down with you, and I can start pouring through the scriptures. And going, why do you think it says this right here? And, and you say, well, you know, the, the people said of Jesus, well, he's a man that speaks with authority, you know. Well, I speak with authority, too. Because I, I'm not afraid of being challenged at all. I don't know it all. That's why I keep my nose in here. When I finally get to the point where I know it all, I'll quit searching the scriptures. I'll quit crying out. I'll quit. But, but let's just all agree that probably the subject of faith might be one of the more important ones. <laughs> you know? And it's not going to be the way that, that it's usually taught. Because we're going to take hard looks at certain scriptures. Because we want to know the truth. We want, to, we want to follow God. And following some weirdo is not going to get you there. You have to follow the Holy Spirit. The dove will land on Jesus. All right. So um, let me just read here in Romans 10. Let's start at verse 6. Romans 10, verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith. Okay. So whatever right standing you have with God has got to be based on faith. Now some of you may remember in the last two classes that we had, we discussed that and we said there is no justice without judgment. Anybody remember that? There is no justice without judgment. Jesus doesn't die and then pet us and tell us to go try to do our best. And I know you're full of flesh. 
but I'm sure it's going to work out. No, he takes us to the cross, and then he imparts his life in resurrection. <clears throat> All right. So to him, the answer is death and resurrection. Life comes out of death. So if we're, we're still struggling trying to find the answer, we have misread the, the cross. We've misread it in a manner that will keep us alive and give us what we need to please God. God gave us what we need to please God. His name is Jesus. And he gave us the answer for our life. It's called try harder. No, it's called death. Okay. So this is this righteousness or right standing. How do we know that we're in right standing with God? If our faith is questionable. All right. So that's why we're dealing with this subject. And, and I can't get it said in one or two classes. That's why it's, it's going to take a little while here. All right, so, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from heaven, which a lot of people are wanting to bring Jesus down from heaven, and that's their faith. And he's saying, don't say that. He didn't say, say that, say that. He said, don't say that. That's not your right relationship with God. You don't want him coming down now before you get the real meaning here. You know, we used to have a bumper sticker back in the 60s when we were hippies. And it says, in big letters, you could read it. It says, Jesus is coming. And people would pull up behind your, your car and look a little closer. And in the little letters, it says, and boy, is he pissed. Uh, for people in Ireland, that means drunk. No, he wasn't drunk. He was hacked off. Are we sure we want Jesus to come back? <laughs> Say not in your heart. Let's bring Jesus down from heaven. That's not the faith. He's going to tell you that's not the faith. That's not the faith. Okay? And he didn't say, well, it's okay, you can say that, but the faith is this. Did anybody hear what I said? He didn't say, it's okay, go ahead and say that, but the faith is this. He said, don't say that, let's keep moving forward in my sentences, he was, Paul would say, to find out what the issue is, okay? Verse 7, or... Who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ again from the dead. Oh, I need Jesus. I need him. I need his life to come in me. I need him to come up from the cross and come in me. Folks, you're already dead with Christ. You need a faith that is working in you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is guiding, it's called a faith walk, it's called the justified, the justified live by this. The justified live by this. They don't think of it every once in a while, they live by this kind of faith, okay? Verse eight, but what shall it say? The word is near thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. He said, confess with your mouth that, that this dead one has been made Lord. That this method of becoming coming, God coming into the earth, and instead of becoming the supreme being on a throne on the earth and controlling everything governmentally like that, he came down, and he came as a man, and then he came as a carpenter, and then he came as a servant to, to men. He was doing all the healing and blessing and taking care of. We, a lot of times we look at that and we go, oh, he's, he's so, you know, powerful. He's so, that's the way we view that. But see, uh, uh, Philippians 2, verse 5 and 6 and 7, isn't describing him like, oh, he's Superman with super power. 
He's serving us. That's the spirit we should have got. But we made a superhero out of it. And we missed the faith that will save you. What do you mean by that? We missed the fact that when God decided to do this plan, God said, There's no, we don't have any alternative here. We do this the way we do it. This is what we do. We die so that others may live. It's, 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 it's the kind of God that these people will serve when they get to know us. Me, us, one. And so he says that faith is that you believe in your heart that God raised the dead up. The dead was the one, not just a dead person, folks, and this is what we'll get into soon, hopefully, because it's real close, but it could be weeks away. <laughs> and that is, the dead here is the innocent. And the benefactor is the guilty. Maybe we believe that. But do we believe that when it comes to the innocent, especially if I'm the innocent? Do we believe that it's okay if I get crucified and not say a word and not open my mouth as long as the wicked that are killing me you know, Jesus said, for, you know, Father, forgive them. We kind of make that generally for the whole world. But there were some people that were driving nails in his hands and stuff like that, you know. They were murdering him. He, he's saying that about his murderers. And I say, there comes a place where faith has increased in you to such a degree but you look, that's what you look for. You look for opportunities to be thought of as evil and bad and as long as someone else can benefit. You draw, you draw the fire away. You know, somebody's going to shoot at them and go, well, you, you dirty, you know, you should, you know, hey, over here. You, know, you draw the fire away from the ones who ought to die instead of making plans and ways to get them killed, you know. All right, so let's see. All right, that's good enough. Um, he knew that the plan called for his death and that the manifest benefits to others would come in his resurrection. In other words, death and resurrection, okay. All right. We're running out of real estate here, so we're going to have to go with the res for resurrection. Death and re anybody here familiar with the concept of death and resurrection, the Christian concept? Death and resurrection. Death, I'm not saying you don't. I'm just trying to stir up your pure minds. God help us all. Our perverted, wandering minds. Death and resurrection is the same as life, okay, is over here. Life comes out of death. Life comes out of death. So when you say death and resurrection, you are saying life comes out of death. Okay? Well, there's not a, there is not a Christian alive who doesn't believe in death and resurrection. Death and resurrection. Death and resurrection. Let's talk about it. Death and resurrection. Yes, death and resurrection. But it's always in terms of, well, Jesus died, 
Um, and that was a, a, a thing that God worked up 2,000 years ago. And boy, he sure, he sure fooled the devil. And now we're all resurrected. God forbid, no. God forbid, no, that he died and we're all resurrected. See, that's the problem in churches and marriages and families and between friends and parents and children and everything else. And I put all that in a Christian context. The problem is we believe in death and resurrection, but we don't believe in life out of death. And it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's, it's, except for our concept of life out of death is not the same as death and resurrection. That's where the breakdown is. In God's eyes, this is exactly the same. He says the faith is to believe in, that life will come out of death. And we say, no, in Jesus' death, I'm going to get resurrected. There's a world of difference between our concepts on that front. And, and, and therefore, there's a world of difference of our faith. All right. All right, so listen carefully to this next paragraph or sentence or however far I get. Faith believes in life out of death because... Now we're going to start dividing it up. Now we're going to start trying to find why is one so foreign to the other. Faith believes in life out of death because faith believes that a death for others that is taken, though undeserved, is a death where the person who dies is not guilty and therefore death cannot hold on be holding on it. I didn't even finish. That's only half the sentence. I have really gotten bad at writing long sentences. I didn't read it all then. But there's a lot to it. Faith believes in life out of death because faith believes that a death for others that is taken, if you'll take that death for others, though you don't deserve it, that is a death where the person who is dying for others is not guilty and therefore death cannot be holding on it because that person was innocent of the crime for which he dies. All right, keep your place here in Romans and let's check it out in Book of Acts. This is, this is the explanation uh, in chapter 2, Acts chapter 2. Verse 24. <clears throat> well, let's go to 23. What a great verse in front of it. Acts 2, 23. Speaking of Jesus, Peter says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, meaning what? God already determined this, that Jesus was going to die. It's God. It's what they determined. They're determined. They're determined to give themselves up for the people who don't deserve it. Okay. So, this was already set up. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Okay, so God is willing to give himself into death for the worst People, in fact, the ones that who have taken him and crucified and slain him. This now is talking about life out of death, not just death and resurrection. Yes, it's the same thing in spirit, but not in doctrine. 
we're trying to we're trying to get the true meaning actually we're trying to get the true meaning of death and resurrection and the faith that that God honors okay so there's two things at work in that verse and one is God is God and two men are men okay and the other thing we're getting out of that verse is God is God and is not going to change based on men, regardless of their motivations. Well, they'll use me. You know, that's not even important. Their use of you is the death that's going to bring glory to God. But we, we can't. See that? We're, we're too busy. We'll, we'll see this. Because this is the whole story of the captivity in Judah. This is it. What we're discussing right here is the ancient paths that we started this whole course on. It, this little chart and the thing we're saying, this. This is it. This is it. This is what will change someone's life. This is what will bring honor to God where he will look upon a little gathering of people and say, you know what, I see that their hearts are going after me on a me level, not a them level. I see that they are committed. I see that they have seen what is important and they're going to pursue it with all their heart. I see that they will fall down before me when my spirit moves and when my word is, is true and ringing true, except we are capable of missing the visitation of God, even with warnings. You know. Now, okay, why are we capable of missing the visitation of God even with warnings? Okay, well, Jesus said on the very day that Peter would deny him, he said, you know, it was that very day, if I'm not mistaken, that Peter said, I won't deny you. No, I will die for you. I believe in death, man. I believe in this, and I, I'm with you. And, and uh, it's going to be, you know, you'll see. Okay. Now, Peter, the, the cock cr is going to crow three times usually you use that to wake up in the morning in some countries they don't have alarm clocks wake up ring hit the snooze button wake up another hit the snooze button i mean really honestly 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 What's it going to take for God to move our hearts instead of our minds or whatever? What's it going to take for us to step out of our definitions and say, my Lord and my God? You, you ever heard anyone in the Bible say that? You ever heard anyone that was so serious about the Lord that when they got in his presence, they just fell down. When, they, when, they, when he spoke, they heard his word and they were moved. <clears throat> well, I mean, I can think of Job and Isaiah and Paul and Daniel and I can think of a bunch of them that were so smitten and then I think of all of the people during Isaiah's time, few of them were smitten. Job had three friends, and they didn't have a clue, didn't have a clue, but they sure could quote the word, and they sure did think that they had the right answer for Job, and they, they, we're in dire need. And in the end, when God takes Job and he says, you know, he, he, the verse before that last one, he, he plows into Job and says, where were you when I did this? And where were you at this and that? 
And Job fell down and repented and sackcloth and ashes. He didn't just go, oh, okay, then I can, <laughs> I can agree with you, Lord. He didn't do that. He fell down and repented as the worst in that group. And then God, once he does that, that's it. You're, you're in the right position. As soon as he does that, as soon as he falls down and he cries out as the worst, the very next verse, God makes him a, a priest. Makes him one of his priests. He says, I want you to pray for these guys. That's it. That's the, pre that's the work of a prayer. I want you to cover them. I want you to pray for them. I want you to manifest my spirit. You die instead of telling them you were right and they're wrong. You die to yourself and you go serve them. You go help them get to me. Well, I'm sure Job did, and I'm sure that he prayed, and I'm sure he meant it, and I have a feeling that maybe he, he really did get the spirit of that whole thing. But we're never really heard from those three guys again. You know, we don't know. We don't know. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure that the, that person was wrong. They were they were wrong. They were uh, abusing something, their privilege or whatever. And <clears throat> and only the faith is going to turn that. I mean, the true faith, the faith that life comes out of death, not the faith that Jesus only did something two thousand years ago, but a belief in his belief system. I know that's, but I'm just trying to get you to, a belief in Jesus' belief system. And it's more than that. It's, a, it's, a, it's faith in him because that's his nature. That's his nature. <clears throat> All right, so the next verse here in Acts 2, uh, verse 23 is, is verse 24. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. What does that mean? Well, folks, from the, you know, and I, this isn't in my notes and what didn't want to take this long trip, but the, the truth is you go all the way back to Genesis, and the day that you eat, you shall surely die. Ezekiel says, the soul that sinneth, he shall die. The soul that sinneth, he shall die. In the day that you eat or sin, you shall die, okay? And that's not death with Christ. That is your own death your own death, and um, 
And so every, everyone who sinned deserves to die, right? All right. But Jesus died for us as a substitute, as a sacrifice, not as a murdered one, not because of anything he did. Jesus died for us as a substitute. Okay, so his death wasn't because of any, he didn't sin. You understand? God said from the very beginning, if you sin, you're going to die. Okay? But Jesus never sinned. But he carried sin when he went to the cross and he died to put it away. But it this is talking about this same Jesus, but it could not be holding on him. It could, he could not be held by this death. Why? Because he was innocent. Because he didn't die a death like everybody else has to die, should die. He died a different death. He died a selfless death. He gave himself, and God said, you know, because when he made Adam and Eve, there was no talk about death in, until sin came along, right? As far as we know, he could have lived forever. I mean, they practically did anyway. No one all them guys, they lived, lived a long, long time. They could have lived forever. And there was no mention of any other kind of death except sacrifice. An innocent, spotless lamb dying in place of us. And when that happened, God said, he can't stay down in death. It can't hold him. He cannot be held by it. It's right here. And so I'm going to raise him. All right. Now let's go back to, to Carolyn's example. If this other person deserved death, as it were, because they sinned, but Carolyn chooses to go down into a death, meaning in this case, not physically, but I'm not going to fight for my rights. I'm not going to do this and that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless and curse not. Okay then that's a selfless death. And if you believe in that kind of death, then you believe in resurrection. That kind of death, there's a resurrection because it, you can't be held by that death. Hmm? All right. Okay, so what about the... the Tweeners. What about the in-betweeners? What about the people that are, that are going to lay down their life, but they don't have that spirit? <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about here? You know, going to lay down, you're going to lay down your life, but you don't have faith. And you're not doing it in faith based on the same faith that Jesus walked by, died by, guess what? There's no resurrection out of it. You say, how many, this doesn't work. How many times have I laid down my life for people and it only got worse for me? Well, I can tell you why, because you, you know, you deserved as much as the guy you were trying to die for, okay? You weren't, you weren't clean. You weren't a clean offering. You weren't washed with water. You know, it talks about that in Hebrews. You weren't a prepared sacrifice at all. You just heard some teaching. And that teaching probably was out of the mouth of this evil man who taught life comes out of death. Well, it's true, but I guess I never really explained it enough. <laughs> because just simply dying, even for someone else, is not the qualification. It is a certain kind of death in which you truly are, you know, I've had people do stuff to me and part of it I deserved. Well, it's kind of hard for me to fully lay down my life for them 
when I also am as guilty as they are on certain fronts. Now, most of us won't just admit that. We'll go, well, they're, they're all evil and I'm pure. I'm, I'm always right. I'm so sublime, you know. Um, the, you know, that's where when in the Old Testament, man, they had to examine that sacrifice. They didn't just grab a lamb and kill it and go, oh, oh there's a little blemish there. I'm sure God won't mind. <laughs> I don't know about God, but you're going to mind when he doesn't raise you up out of it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So what does that call for? Well, I'll tell you exactly what it calls for. In the Old, Old Testament sacrifices, uh, speak to that is it calls for us to examine, examine ourselves, see whether we're in the faith. Have I ever heard that before? Yeah, the Bible, it's funny, that's right, it's in there somewhere. Um, the Old Testament sacrifices speak to it in that they want us to examine our motives. Now, that's not as easy as it sounds. Because if we are selfishly motivated in general, then every man's way is right in his own eyes. That's what the Bible says. And that's me, that's anybody. I mean, this, this is stuff, you know, in, in the hard years before I got to a place where I could start examining, you know, I had to st stop that. You know there's something. You need, you know, I mean, I talk to myself like, you know that, stop acting like you're the victim. And see that victim mentality right there? That's your worst enemy. Jesus wasn't a victim in, in a sense from the murderers he was a victim, but in truth he was a sacrifice to God, see? And so we, we fall into that victim thing and that makes them evil and that makes us pure when the victim mentality is just as evil as the abusing mentality. It's not Christ and it's not innocent. And that's, you know, I mean, over the years I've had to counsel with all kind of people going through all kind of stuff. And one of the most common, you know, in a victim mentality, a lot of times, rolls forth out of self-pity. It is, I know. I, you know how I know that? Because I went on the mountaintop and spent m months with the Lord and he showed me that. No, no, I was down in the valley and I saw it in me. And I can tell you, I can, I can spot it in me. I can spot it in me. I can now, I can spot it in me. I go, oh my God, that's that stuff. You, you know, talk about a and a gag. Anybody remember where that, that, that theme came from? Other than the Bible, I mean, where I taught it. Yeah. You know? And it wasn't, and it wasn't, it wasn't one day I stumbled across that scripture and I went, this would make a good sermon. I think I'll, I think I'll sermonize on this and really impress him. No sorry. I was already working at, you know, I, 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 when I travel a lot more than what I do now, I would tell people, I try to practice what I preach. And I try to preach what I've been practicing. Get it? I don't just practice what I preach. I try to preach what I've been practicing. One of the ways to get it in you, I'm so thankful God made me a, a teacher, a preacher. Because I get to say it all the time, confess it, stand in front of you and expect you to, to hold me accountable. And people tend to do that with the pastor in a certain sense. I mean, you know, because you go, wait a minute, you know. Of course, now I'm eccentric, so it's okay. But, you know, that, that's a good thing for me. It's a good thing for me. And that's why I never, ever, ever mind questions or whatever. Because it gives me a chance to, you know, I, that's why I don't answer everything quickly enough for people.
Because I pull back in and I get in there and I say, Lord, just help me to see what would be my motives or if, if I think you're leaning this direction, am I thinking that because that's your nature or is there some advantage to me or, you know, and to just lay it all out. That's what they did. They opened up that sacrifice and laid out all the parts and examined them and held them up before God. And said, what do you think? You know, we... You know, the burnt offering, that's what it did. You know, it wasn't just, well, let's throw it up there on the altar and kill it and throw lighter fluid on it. <laughs> woo burnt offering. No siree. No siree. No, it was take the time to open it up, open the lamb up, look at it, lay it out, lay it in order. And see what's working in him and then look at yourself. Are you a spotted lamb? Then don't go into death. You say, well, does that mean I can mistreat the person who's been mistreating me? <laughs> you, you know, I'm not giving you permission for anything, but you're probably already doing that anyway. On some front. Because we always got to, you know, revenge is getting back at somebody who did something wrong to you. Have you ever noticed, I'm going to try to end with this. Have you ever noticed how much the New Testament, especially the latter part of the epistles, talk about not having revenge? Revenge. It's, it's not like in one place. It's in almost all of them. And you know what? It's one of the few. Listen to this. It's one of the few teachings that they brought from the Gospels over into that is sort of word for word of what Jesus said. Did you know that? I mean, because I, I, I look at this stuff. I mean, you know, I don't ever want to stand in front of people and say, well, you're not going to find a whole lot of the word-for-word -word teachings of Jesus in the epistles. And you're not going to find hardly any mentions of miracles or anything Jesus did in the Gospels. Unless, I wouldn't say that, unless I've taken the time to go, you know what? Oh, my God. See, I have to be impacted. I have to be impacted. Now, I don't know what the effect is on y'all, but I have to be impacted or I shouldn't even be a minister. I shouldn't even be a Christian, really. You know, we, we say, well, the minister, the minister, you know. But, but this thing of revenge or getting back, it's big throughout the, in, the latter part of much of the epistles including Romans, which, Lord willing, if we don't spend too long on this faith thing. So why am I even making that point? I'm making that point because that, to do that, is not the faith of Abraham. It's, Abraham said, I'm dead. I can't bring forth my faith is that you'll do it in this dead carcass, that you'll bring forth the promised seed out of me and it won't be me because I'm dead. There it is, there's the faith. That's the faith. That's what we talked about the last two classes, Thursday. And so there is, there is in these latter parts of the epistles, there's all this practical stuff, but you know what? It's nothing more than the taking, partaking, eating of this nature and spitting it out in, in practical form. And it all matches up. If you, if, you have, if you really have a picture of that faith up there, you can take those little phrases or sentences go, yep, there it is. Let me try this one. Oh, my God, there it is. Oh, my God. In other words, it's not telling you be good, stop doing that, da 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 It's not telling you that. It's telling you to understand God, then let Jesus live in you. But he lives in you by faith, right? He dwells in your heart by faith. Is that right? 
then what kind of faith do we have? What, do you understand what I'm saying? What kind of faith do we have? Because that's the kind of God we're going to put in there. It's be according to our faith. But this one says, if you believe that this self-giving one was sorely mistreated, and I looked at it, this is the Father speaking, and I looked at it and said, that's a desire of my heart right there. That's the thing I honor the most. I'm raising him from the dead. Then you shall be saved, if you understand that. If you understand that, then, and, and again, we got a lot of scripture and a long way to go here, but that's the, that's the deal. That's the bottom line. Let me see if, the, if I got this. There's one, one other sentence here. Um, that Jesus was innocent of the crime for which he dies. That means that for faith to be effectual under resurrection, there must be a death, and specifically a death that is taken unselfishly for others. You must believe in that kind of death, therefore you believe in its results, resurrection. If you believe that that death is God and is what God honors, then you have every right to believe in resurrection. Right? If it's an unselfish, innocent death, they're going to be raised. You have every right to believe that. All right, let's stop and we'll, we shall return next class.